Hi, hi everybody. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to speak today directly to the graduates because they're the important ones here. Um, I hope my teleprompter operator can hear me. Yes, because he said that we had to get the microphone very close. But I'm going to be improvising and reading at the same time. So I'm very happy to be here. And um, it is a great honor to be here with you on this special occasion. And I know just how special it is because um, to this day, I remember vividly how I felt 36 years ago, the afternoon when I received my university degree. I was, I was full of nerves, full of excitement. You know, those butterflies that you feel in your stomach when you know that you're about to embark on an unknown path in search of a great adventure. And without a doubt, there is a great adventure waiting for you out there. Because in a way, that fantastic journey called life begins for all you graduates this week. What I do not remember from my graduation is who gave the speech or what that person said. And you know why? Because after all, what you really want to hear on a day like this one and this week is advice on what you should pack for the suitcase for the wonderful voyage of life. And on my graduation, I heard nothing about that. So now that you're about to set sail, I'll share with you my list of must-haves to navigate in the sometimes turbulent seas of life. The first is, let your principles be your compass. You will learn that in life, every decision that you will make will have repercussions on the final outcome. The first of those principles should be a commitment to excellence, which is something that I learned from my father, who, by the way, uh, is a Princeton graduate. So. I'm applauding him wherever he is in Puerto Rico. A, a lot of people don't know this, but before I was a journalist, I was an Olympic swimmer. Uh, for the majority of my childhood and adolescence, my father and I began the mornings at 5 a.m. every morning with a trip to, to the Olympic-sized pool in the uh, University of Mayagüez. Uh, my father was a chancellor at the time. And my team practiced usually uh, Monday through Friday, and then rested on the weekends, but of course, not me. My dad made sure that we were in the pool first thing Saturday morning. He used to say to me, and this was very, very him, uh, he said, if you want to be a champion, you have to swim the extra mile. And I remember one day, one day he came home with videos uh, that showed the new technology, the new, the new techniques that the Australian champions used to uh, put into practice so that we could study them together. And in the next competition, sure enough, I not only uh, swam better than ever, but I set a new record for my age. I thought that with that, that accomplishment, was, uh, he was going to calm down a little bit. But nope, not him. Uh, he wasn't like that. He approached me. He came to me solemnly, solemnly with, a, with a stopwatch. And he got it out of his pocket. And he said, now that there is no one that you, can beat you in the island, this stopwatch is your new rival, your new opponent. I said, oh my God. So in 1971, I earned a spot on the, in the Puerto Rican junior national team for the Central American Games that were held in Havana, Cuba. And my teams and I were so excited to be there. It was our first international competition. And of course, we took over the hotel. We were playing pillow fights all night long and talking up till dawn. We hardly slept. I won three medals, one gold, one silver, and one bronze. But guess what? My dad was so disappointed, so upset that they were not all gold, that he did not even go pick me up at the airport. Oh. I know, I always get this reaction when I tell that story. Uh, people think, oh my God, she's a, she was abused when she was a child. But, but no, 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 it was tough love. It was tough love because he had sacrificed so much that, it could be, that he knew I could be the best. Um, in practice, I was doing better times than the, than the winners in that competition with ease. So if I didn't win all three gold medals, it was because I didn't sleep and that affected my performance. And that's why I tell you graduates that you should never, ever lose focus. In the swimming pool, I learned many of the lessons that have uh, helped me succeed professionally. Among them, amongst them, that you should never hesitate, that instead of fearing challenges, you should go right, right on them with determination and that one should never settle for something pretty good. That's not a good idea. My dad, my dad was also like that with grades. Of course, he graduated magna cum laude. Forgot to mention that little detail. Um, once I came home with a C, imagine, with a C to my house, he looked at me in the eye, straight in the eye, and he said, 
Mari, and he said something that I'll never forget. Mari, I don't ever want you coming to this house with a C. You can only bring an A or an F. You have to be the best of the best or the worst of the worst, but never mediocre. Okay? <laughs> You see, because anyone can be good at something, but it takes discipline and it takes a lot of effort to do great things. So remember this, success does not come by chance. And that brings me to another one of the principles that I think you should bring your suitcase, and that's loyalty and gratitude. This is a story that is going to have an, an, an ending that's going to make sense, okay? After I graduated from Loyola University in Louisiana, I returned to Puerto Rico to start my career as a journalist. But I found that there were no jobs available for people like me with a diploma and zero experience. I remember when an executive in one of the local stations told me to my face that he couldn't hire me because he wasn't into babysitting. That was like very, very hardcore reality. So I settled for a position as a junior copywriter in an advertising agency. It was not the television job that I wanted, definitely, but I figured that at least it was a job within the communications industry and that once I had one foot inside, the chances of running into an interesting uh, proposition, opportunity, were a lot greater. And I was right. During a ceremony to recognize the best in advertising, I met a media mogul um, who shortly after opened a 24-hour uh, news station in Puerto Rico. He was looking for people just like me, hungry to go after a story and willing to get paid almost nothing. So, so he hired me and I gave it my all. I really wanted him to be proud of me. And in a short time, I was the top reporter of the station. And that's when I got the call. Remember the unwilling babysitter, remember? Well, he called me because he wanted to offer me a job, okay? Now he wanted to offer me a job. He wanted to hire me with a salary three times what I was making, and was quick to remind me that his station had three times more viewers than mine. And guess what? I rejected the offer and never told anyone. And many people would think, why would she do this crazy thing? Or at least, why wouldn't she at least negotiate to get a higher salary in her job? I really never considered either one of those options. I felt immense gratitude to my boss because he bet on me when nobody else would. And at that moment, I had no idea. I, I never imagined that doing the right thing instead of letting me be carried away by greed, you know, three times the salary and ego, three times the viewers, that was going to unleash a series of events that would lead me to my dreams. After several weeks, my boss called me into his office I do not know how, but he found out about the offer that I got and that I rejected, and he was gonna reward me for my loyalty. So he assigned me to cover, at the time, the most coveted news, which was the opening of the Soviet Union. So thanks to the documentary that I did um, in the Soviet Union and that I brought from Moscow, I was recognized as the Journalist of the Year by the Chamber of Commerce of Puerto Rico. The night I received, that award, I was in the same table with the guest of honor, which was at the time um, Reverend Jesse Jackson, who was aspiring for the nomination uh, for the presidency of the United States that, during that time. Uh, there were international journalists, of course, following him. Uh, they all wanted to interview him, but they made it very clear that he was gonna talk to anybody, nobody that night, and you know that was set in stone. How I managed to convince him to talk to me exclusively in an interview, is another story, but the fact is that our meeting that night met headlines. It made headlines, and that's important because I remember that the journalists that were there, they were furious. One in particular was the director of a radio station in Puerto Rico who complained to Jackson's team for talking to me and not to others. I tell you this, there's a reason, because weeks later, that radio director was named top news executive of the Univision Network affiliate in New York. And he called to offer me a job. He had seen my determination, my tenacity, and he said that he wanted people just like me in his team. This time, of course, this time I did approach my, my boss, and he agreed that this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And with his blessing, I took off to New York. I accepted the offer, and it opened the important doors of the Hispanic television market to me in the United States. And thanks to that, I'm here today. Now, remember, it all began with doing the right thing with rejecting a tempting offer out of loyalty and gratitude. So, something else that you must include in your suitcase is the ability to forgive and move on. That's something that I learned right after I moved to New York, 
right off the bat. My boss, remember the radio guy who now was a new boss in New York? Well, he was, um, he left the company just three months after I arrived in New York. Um, his replacement came fast and furious, ready to install a new team, which included an anchor woman in my place. He had never seen me, but that really didn't matter, and I was really totally devastated. My contract gave me the two options. It gave me two options. The first one was to leave and cash the remainder three years of salary, or stay and stay as a reporter and live with the humiliating demotion. My first reaction was to do what? Listen to my ego, to quit, leave, cash in and leave. But then, thankfully, my then husband opened my eyes and he told me, Mari, you have to stay. You have to swallow your pride. Um, there's a lot that you can learn from this news director. If he thinks that you need to keep on learning, stay with him and he will teach you things and you might get something out of it, who knows? He also told me that if I still wanted to leave later, it's always better, remember this, to um, get a new job if you already have one. So I stayed. The next morning, my new boss called me to his office and he said the following, okay, Mari, Maria Celeste, he called me by my full name, he was very formal, he, go, he said, Maria Celeste, you have a bag of lemons. Now you can eat sour lemons or you can make lemonade. It's your choice. And I thought I understood what he meant by that. I said, well, that, that probably means that if I'm able to make the best of this bad situation, and the answer is yes, so let me prove it to him. That day, I, in my eagerness to, to show him that I was a team player, I ran all over New York until I found the perfect greeting card. It was one that had one lemon in the cover. And inside I wrote, let's make lemonade. I was so excited. The next morning, I went to his office. With, I put a bag of lemons on the cart on top of his desk, waiting for him to get there. And I thought he was going to melt with this cute and witty gesture of mine. Ha! He never even acknowledged it, ever. He never did, never said a word about it. Um, what he did was he hired new reporters, many from radio who had never been in television, had zero experience. And he put me at the end of the line um, behind all of them for me to fight for a story. He even hired a weatherman and gave him my office. Así que the newsroom watch as I gather all my belongings and move to this plastic counter, tiny plastic counter, it was like this big, facing a wall, no phone, no computer. He definitely wanted to prove a point and mostly he ultimately wanted me to quit. So for about six, dog, six, six months, I was eating hot dogs, nuked in the microwave. I was very depressed, looking at the ceiling, wondering what was gonna happen, uh, fighting not to get in the next plane home. My husband would tell me, don't worry, Mari, you're on your way up, and he's on his way down, referring to the news director. So I took charge of the only thing I could control, which was my determination. I went to work every day with a smile and sat on my tiny, <laughs> tiny plastic counter for eight hours, unless one reporter was absent or sick, in which every time I would get an assignment, whenever that would happen, I would dedicate every effort to make sure that my report was the best of the newscast. I really wanted my boss to like me, but he would never give me the time of day. Then something unexpected happened. I received a phone call from my boss's boss. It was the news director of the network. He had seen me on camera, and he wanted me to fly to Los Angeles immediately to anchor the national newscast, the weekend newscast. Uh, so my, na my national debut on television was, um, was celebrated with high fives. Everybody was very happy. I was invited back as a regular um, substitute anchor on the weekends. And then out of nowhere, for no particular reason, my boss fired me. It didn't make sense, but life is like that sometimes. And, I spent two weeks uh, living in uncertainty, not knowing what was going to happen. And after a decade, after um, two weeks, then I was hired by Univision. I was there and I had an incredible opportunity. Um, I was there for 10 years and then I embarked in a new adventure with the competitor Telemundo, where I am now. And I will never forget the day of the announcement of my jumping to Telemundo. Um, I was on stage in front of some 50 um, members of the press, flanked by the executives of Telemundo and NBC. I remember we had our hands like this, like victory sign, and there were a bunch of uh, cameras, like, suppose that you're the cameras, you're the reporters, like, flashing, and we're up here. And in the middle of that hands-up victory, I saw him. I saw him. My former boss, 
the one that loved lemons. He was down there. I was up here, and he was down there. He was waiting for me to shake his hand. And then I remember the words of my ex-husband. He's on his way down. You're on your way up. He was no longer the news director of the New York uh, Univision affiliate. He had moved to Miami and was working as editor of a minor news magazine. Uh, it was like a newspaper insert kind of a thing, which is, it was considerably a step down from what he was before. So this time I was the one in the more favorable situation. There in front of all our peers and our cameras, I really could have given him the cold shoulder. I could have done it, but the thought really never crossed my mind. I really didn't have any desire to make him feel small like he once tried to make me feel small. He said, congratulations. I shook his hand from up here, down there. I said, Congratula he said, congratulations. And I said, great, thanks for coming. And I moved on. And it, it really felt good to have the opportunity to be the bigger person and to be gracious. It would have never been, it would have been so easy in that moment to yield to bitterness, to yield to having a grudge. But I know that if I have wasted my time, those years blaming him, feeling sorry for myself, I would have never been able to focus on my career. That's why it's so important to forgive and move on. Now, going back to the suitcase, the suitcase that you need for this journey that you call life, um, try to pack lightly. <laughs> Leave behind the ego that is like a heavy stone, is very, very, weights a lot, and will not let you move forward. The ego make, makes us have a distorted perception of reality, and it leads only to failure. Throw away the prejudice, the grudges. Uh, prejudice um, basically makes you see false mirages in the horizon. So you don't want to get lo lo lost in the way, so what I recommend is that you cast out hate and resentment as well. You will find it liberating to travel lightly. So the question is what to bring in your suitcase. Like I said, carry your principles. When the path seems darker, they will help you find your north, your true north. Sometimes you're going to feel in life like, like you will capsize and that your ship is going to, um, that you're going to drown. It's going to be that kind of sinking feeling. And that's when you must put your faith in the compass of your convictions, your moral compass. Let yourself be guided by that and stand firm at the helm. Navigate in a world of substance and purpose, not one of gossip and material things. You will realize that fewer people are traveling in this path and that will help you move faster and achieve your personal uh, and professional goals with greater speed. Bring your optimism and your sense of humor. Uh, the common denominator in all the successful people I have interviewed throughout my career is that they all see the glass half full. Where others see problems, they see possibilities. At the end of the trip, what really matters is finding your passion. Find your passion, that's key. And also try to find the way of being, feel at peace with yourself. Knowing that all the way you did everything right, for the right reasons. Because to be a, a good sailor, you must be first a good human being. 36 years from now, today is very possible that you may not remember who gave the speech, but I hope that you remember the words at least, and that you remember the good wishes that I have for you. Buen viaje and good trip. Alguien que sorprende a habitantes de un río en el oriente boliviano y que creen es la víbora gigante de tres cabezas que vive en el lugar. Existe esa víbora de tres cabezas.